Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Sunday Night Edition. It's our great pleasure to, uh, to introduce and bring in Dr. Katie Greiner. What is wrong with this cornea and can a squirrel lens help? Dr. Greiner is an optometrist and chief executive officer at Northeast Ohio Eye Surgeons, where she dedicates her practice to comprehensive eye care for the whole family, including evaluation and treatment of dry eye disease, diabetic eye disease, corneal diseases, and irregularities with, with special contact lens fitting. She's also the optometric director for refractive and elective surgeries, sur services conducting LASIK and PR case uh, evaluations uh, at, at, the, at their facility. She is also a 2009 graduate of the year at, o at the Ohio State University's College of Optometry. She holds several prestigious leadership positions within the state, uh, and she is a frequent lecturer at the annual eye conference for East West. I will say that we had the, Greg and I had the opportunity to meet Katie when she was doing a promotional talk being sponsored by a company at one of our live meetings. And I know that the other companies uh, were, 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 there as well. And they, they had as their promotional speakers, some very, very prominent national speakers. And I, and I know that the company that was sponsoring Katie had, was a little nervous that, that she was going up against these national level speakers. And once she started and she was about five minutes into her presentation, I leaned over to Greg and said, they had nothing to worry about because she certainly held her own. And Greg and I are find, think it's very important in our roles to mentor younger people, we reached out to Katie and said, please put together a COPE approved lecture. You need to be doing more of this. And we, we wanna help her and support her. And we, we're hoping to help and support and develop the next, uh, next generation of speakers because whether we want it to admit it or not, Greg and I are getting a little close to our, our sell by dates and we wanna help the next generation coming up. And I think that after having heard her talk one time, we are in very capable hands. So with that, Katie, please take over and give another knockout performance. Well, thank you. That was a really nice introduction. And I, I have to thank both of you because they really have mentored me. Um, I've been very excited for this talk. You know, I chose Sunday night and uh, I hope you're all along for the journey with me. There's a lot of people on here and we have a lot to cover, but we'll try to make it fun. And uh, this is the nicest I've ever looked on a Sunday night, but I will tell you I'm wearing pajama pants and I hope you all are too. So I love the cornea. Um, I think as soon as I learned that there was this amazing structure that's you know 500 microns thick that does so much and can have so many things wrong with it, uh, that is where I decided to focus my practice on. I am in Northeast Ohio, uh, LeBron country. One of my offices is directly across the street from his um, home in Akron. And we partner with the LeBron James Foundation to do eye exams. Um, but really what I do in the practice is work with two cornea specialists that have seen so many train wreck corneas and, and realized as ophthalmologists that maybe not all those corneas need surgery. And maybe someone like an optometrist can help that patient almost more than they could. And I think that's a great niche in our world of optometry where we can really take these patients and change their entire quality of life. And so that's why I'm going to focus tonight on a lot of corneal diseases and corneal issues, but then I'm going to end with how scleral lenses have made a huge difference in my practice and can in yours. And if you have no intentions of fitting scleral lenses, that's okay. Just make sure you know who you can refer to. And I see that a lot of you do that already so that we can partner together. I think that's so important that optometry partner with optometry and we share our patients to get them the best help that they can have. So with that, let's kick things off. Uh, disclosures, I created these slides. I do have a couple um, disclosures for companies that I work with, but nothing tonight will have any direct financial or proprietary interest in these companies. And there is no commercial bias or superiority for any of the products that may be mentioned tonight. So we're gonna kick it off with a lot of photos. So make sure you're close to your screen and you uh, have your reading glasses on if you need them. because we're, we're gonna get into the intricacies of the cornea. So we're gonna start with this photo and then we are gonna launch a poll question. If you printed out the slides in advance, you'll have all the answers. So try not to look at those. 
Um, so we're going to look at this cornea here. You can see there's some central and mid peripheral issues going on. And I'll go back and forth here. But what is wrong with that cornea, everybody? I'm hopefully kicking this off with one of my easier ones was that uh, epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, Neisman corneal dystrophy, a Reese Buckler corneal dystrophy, that's one we don't hear too often, or a recurrent corneal erosion. And you might catch on tonight, number two is the theme of my talk, will a scleral lens help? So I'll throw you a bone there that probably in most answers, it will. It looks like I can play along too, here we go. You certainly can. Joe, am I back? I switched over to my computer, am I sounding okay? You are. Perfect, thank you. I was flying wounded there, my computer needed rebooted. So remember, there's our cornea here. All right, people, remember we need to make this live and interactive. So this is part of the COPE rule. So we can get a few more participants like we did in the polling question. That'd be great. And then we'll stop and end the poll. And we'll go from there. Oops, someone's in the waiting room. There we go. All right. I think and I also there. just launched the handout. Thank you, sir. AKA the answers. All right, we're going to end that poll and we're going to share those results. And you can see here that we got about 84% are saying that uh, epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. We have about 72% saying that, uh, yes, a scleral lens will help in this arena. So very few mentioned about the other corneal conditions that you have there. Right. You guys did awesome. So the majority rules here, that definitely was epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, something that you probably see on the regular in your office. And I will tell you how scleral lens can help those patients. And then we'll review a lot of the dystrophies that are, are listed here. So we're going to be talking about the anterior stromal and posterior coronal dystrophies. These are primary diseases. They are inherited. They're typically in both eyes, which obviously is unfortunate for these patients. They tend to be symmetric, but not always at the same pace of symmetry, they catch up to each other. And also, unfortunately, they are progressive. Uh, no systemic diseases typically associated with the dystrophies. And also, sadly, they can appear earlier in life, even in someone's 20s, and tend to get worse over time. I think this is another reason I was drawn to the cornea when I was a student, because you know I was in my 20s, and I was learning about all of the issues that can affect people in my generation. And those are people that are trying to go to school, start a career, have a family, you know, begin their lives, and they're being affected by some really, you know, awful and traumatic issues. So here on basement membrane dystrophy, again, good job. We know that the nickname for that is mapped out fingerprint. I tell my patients when I see it, it looks like someone took their finger and smudged the surface. It is our most common of the anterior dystrophies. And it will cause an irregular and redundant epithelial tissue that leads to irregular astigmatism. And when someone has irregular astigmatism, what better way to control that uh, than by fitting you know, a specialty contact? But of course, there are many other ways we need to manage this first before we would even consider a contact lens. You can get these little cystic changes in the cornea. This is one of the most common conditions to cause those you know, upon awakening recurrent erosions in about 10%. It's a dominant inheritance, so we see a lot of it in the population. And as you guys already know, it requires a lot of lubrication. I'm a fan of overnight bland ointments and doing all kinds of protective measures. You know, if they need to sleep with masks to close their eyes at night, um, using preservative-free tears during the day. And then we're going to talk about the surgical interventions. I do work in a cornea practice, and we get a lot of referrals from our local optometrists to talk to the patients about what else can be done if this is something that becomes debilitating. So three of the big ones that we'll see are anterior stromal puncture, superficial keratectomy, or the cool kids call it a super K, and that uh, you could dress up as that character for Halloween, um, and then phototherapeutic keratectomy, also known as PTK. So if you're not familiar with the anterior stromal puncture, this is probably done the least of all of them um, in my office. It can be performed right at chair side in Ohio. And I don't know, actually, Greg or Joe, if you know if other states can do it. But in Ohio, we cannot do this procedure. Um, but you use a 26-gauge needle under anesthesia. And you literally just create tiny little punctures 
at the area of irritation where you're seeing the um, epithelial dystrophy at. And there's pretty low risk of causing any problems. It'll cause tiny little scars. You obviously don't wanna do this procedure if it's dead center in the visual axis, but otherwise it does have a, a decent success rate and is something worth trying for these types of patients. The super K um, is removing the layer of corneal epithelial tissue all the way down to Bowman's. Obviously we do this under anesthesia and our surgeons perform this in the OR or in our LASIK suite. And then they'll do a little polishing of Bowman's layer to get rid of some of the defects. And then just like you would for uh, say a PRK procedure, we place a bandage contact lens and we allow healthier epithelium to regrow. It's great for these inflammatory type conditions, superficial scarring and defects, obviously never in the um, context of infection. And something that is really a clinical pearl is if you're sending patients for cataract surgery, especially with all the premium surgeries we can offer today, you know, they're paying extra money to have toric corrections and to have multifocal or extended depth of focus. We have to look at the cornea and tell those surgeons, sometimes surgeons forget there's a cornea there, and they look at that cataract and we have to tell them, you know, hey, I've, I've seen this patient for a long time and they have basement membrane dystrophy. Um, maybe that's something that needs remedy prior to uh, perfecting a refractive cataract surgery. So we do a lot of cornea treatments like super K's to get the best outcome from cataract surgery. So that's one big point I want to definitely make tonight. And then a phototherapeutic keratectomy, also known as PTK. This involves debriding the cornea and then actually using an eczema laser. So we will obviously do this in a surgical suite. And you don't wanna do this if, if more than 10 to 20% of the superficial cornea is affected because if you go too deep in the cornea, it's like you're doing a refractive surgery or like a LASIK surgery and you don't wanna over thin the cornea. But it's just under topical anesthesia. Again, that bandage contact lens is very useful. And we have seen surgeons at the same time combine this with refractive surgery. So they'll get rid of those little irregular areas on the cornea and then actually do a, a LASIK or a PRK following. So what does EBMD cause a lot of the times? Recurrent erosions. You are all familiar with recurrent erosions. You see them probably several times a month. These are repeat episodes when that epithelium uh -huh. breaks down. And it can be caused just from EBMD, or they definitely can be caused by mechanical issues like past trauma. Your patient comes in, they say the first thing they did when they opened their eyes this morning was felt pain and tearing and irritation. And what do you see but that picture in the bottom right hand part of the slide there where they've got an epithelial irregularity or defect. Similar treatment to your basement membrane dystrophies, lots of lubrication, especially ointments. Um, oftentimes, doctors will find that a bandage lens works really well. We'll talk about the use of doxycycline. I do use that quite a bit in my practice. And if this is something that keeps recurring and the patient does not want to do something like a surgery, I have fit them in scleral lenses to protect the cornea and keep it lubricated better throughout the day so it doesn't wear down and, and have um, desiccation overnight. Again, we can use anterior stromal puncture in these cases, a super K or a PTK as well. Doxycycline. So I should have done a poll question for this, but um, I'm hoping that people know the role of doxycycline that's out there, but they also know when it's contraindicated. Uh, the MM2, uh, MMP3, or twos and nines, um, these enzymes can be increased in the tear film of patients like this, especially patients with recurrent erosions. And that makes the stability of those adhesions of your membranes of the epithelial tissue become really unstable. And tetracyclines have shown to decrease these, uh, the activity of these enzymes. And it's proven really effective with something like doxycycline that's typically pretty affordable, readily available, that taking it at about a 50 milligram twice a day dose for several months can actually help with those adhesions. It, there's definitely contraindications. You need to make sure you're not using it in someone of childbearing age or pregnancy. Uh, if you remember board's questions, it can cause um, issues with bone growth in the fetus and it can also cause teeth discoloration. We would never give this to children. You can have sun sensitivity with doxycycline. So I don't prescribe it if they're going to Florida and they refuse to wear uh, you know, a hat or sunscreen. Uh, there are contraindications with taking it directly with, with dairy and milk products. 
And uh, of course, if they're allergic to the tetracycline categories. But you could even send us a chat out there and tell us, you know, if you found that doxycycline has been of use in your clinic. All right, Niesman, this is one you probably don't see very often. I think in hey, my- I've Hey, been Katie, yeah. before you jump on and go further, Please. you know, our, um, our surveys tell us, you know, that they don't like when initials are used. So I'm just going to tell, let people know the MMP is matrix oh, metallopeptidase. Yes, it's an M dime. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's and in worries. most of my slides, I do not use just that. So I'm sorry, that was a long one. And I don't, don't, don't worry, don't apologize. we are been doing <laughs> this for a year and a half. We know our audience, we know the survey. So I'm just letting people know what that is. And then the other question that I have is have, and I've had a lot of success with cryopreserved or pro caras and using for, um, for recurrent corneal erosion. I'm almost afraid to jinx myself. I think I'm up to like 24 patients in a row where you know, I debride the cornea with a Wexel mm -hmm. sponge, the anterior basement membrane, it's dystrophied, sometimes limbus to limbus, it comes off. But I then I use, and I believe, in my opinion, cryopreserve would probably be the best one for this, not dehydrated because of the lost biologics. And then I put that cryopreserve membrane on, or we're able to do that as a, a way to avoid the stromal micropuncture. And, uh, you know, I asked a question, you know, Oklahoma, I have an Oklahoma license and Kenneth here, I know we can do it in Oklahoma. Um, that's out there, but no other one really replied that's out there. So it's a way to kind of get around that micropuncture and the scarring if you want to do pro cares, mm -hmm. which is probably allowed in every state. Yes. And I, I'm glad you brought that up, Greg. I do talk about that a little in the future slides, but I think there's a great place for those membranes. Uh, it's definitely something that we use in the office and also our surgeons will use it in surgery. They'll do a super K and at the end of it, a lot of times they'll um, apply a membrane just to make sure that everything grows back, um, you know, in, in great condition. And they've seen huge improvements in their surgical outcomes with the use of those. So I am a big fan. I do enjoy using the Procara and doing the tape Sorafi. If you're, if, you, if the audience is familiar with that, they like you to tape the lid down a little for added comfort. So I think that's a great topic to make sure we bring up. And I love that our Oklahoma doctors, though, can do the anterior stromal puncture. Thank you for sharing that, Kenneth. Um, go, go Oklahoma. That's awesome. So Meesman, uh, this is pretty uncommon. Um, I was going to say that I've been in practice for 11 years and probably seen this in a cornea practice only a handful of times. But there's a great picture down at the bottom there of these little tiny micro cysts and they tend to go in between the region of the eyelids. They are early in life. You can see these in someone's younger age, 20s and 30s, and they don't really start to become more visually significant or bothersome until middle age. They can burst and they can cause some breakthrough, which would um, add to some pain. And it's because their keratin um, is mutated in the cornea. If there are flare-ups uh, for the patients that I was referencing, I've had to use bandage contacts to keep them comfortable, but they don't tend to get those uh, recurrent erosions like your basement membrane dystrophy patients do. So typically these patients, you don't really need to do much in terms of intervention, but if it does break through the cornea, then a super K um, can be effective. So hopefully all of you will get to see maybe one of these in your lifetime to say you've experienced it, but I kind of refer to this as another good boards question. And then there's some sub-epithelial pacifications of Bowman's. There's two types. Most commonly, you'll hear of Reese Buckler corneal dystrophy. And I'll show you pictures of this on the next slide. This is when you'll have these rod-shaped fibers. Um, these are, again, in young people. And the Reese Buckler form occurs younger than the Thiel-Benke form, which are these honeycomb curly fibers. It's autosomal dominant in its inheritance. But again, these aren't that common of dystrophies you will get the recurrent erosions. And again, in this condition that you can end up with some irregular astigmatism. So you can use a specialty contact to protect the cornea and to help with that irregular astigmatism. This one can get so bad that sometimes you do need cornea transplants. And um, I have abbreviations there, but we're going to talk about um, the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasties and the penetrating keratoplasties on the next slide. Uh, there is sadly because, you know, you guys, these are, these are inherited diseases. When we do grafts for these patients, 
uh, these diseases can come right back. These dystrophies can come right back because it's, you know, there's a genetic component. So it can help them, but we do have to align their expectations. So here um, are your two, uh, type one and type two, where we can see more fibrous and more honeycomb, if you can distinguish those. I think, honestly, as we said, the treatment's pretty similar. So if you called it type one and it was really type two, um, you'll probably treat them very similarly. So here's those abbreviations in the flesh. PK, full thickness cornea transplant. We are transplanting top to the bottom of the cornea there. And um, that is the kind of old school way of doing transplants. There's definitely still a need for those today in certain conditions. We'll talk about that tonight. But the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty is a phenomenal alternative to a PK. I love that option, especially in my um, younger patients that I know will probably need several transplants in their lifetime because we're preserving their endothelial function. So we are transplanting um, cornea down to decimase uh, in the, into the stroma, but we are leaving their endothelial tissue intact. And so we can have less risk of rejections and opacifications and edema afterwards, and they do tend to heal faster. So it's giving them that nice um, superficial and stromal cornea change without going all the way through the cornea. All right, so that's section one. You guys did it, you survived. I don't think anyone's sleeping yet. So hopefully we're keeping you engaged with a photo and a poll question. This looks kind of similar to our first photo, but I'm gonna tell you um, this is a little deeper. So that might help you here as we move on to uh, the stromal portion of the cornea. So what is wrong with that cornea? Granular dystrophy, macular, lattice dystrophy, Schneider crystalline corneal dystrophy. And you guys think a scleral lens will help. So go ahead and get your votes in there. And I will show you the picture again. If you move your poll over and doesn't block the center of your screen, you can see there. I think the questions might get a little trickier as the night goes on, but this one kind of speaks for itself in the pattern that you see. Yeah, the answers are rolling in here nicely. No chats have really, or no questions have rolled in. Uh, Joe put the handout in at 714. So everything looks good so far. We got a few more people and I'll end this poll. Try and find that poll out there, guys, to help make this live and interactive so that we can meet the, those requirements. So I'm gonna end that poll. I'm gonna share the results. And we got a great audience. Look at you guys. So we have 13% saying granular dystrophy. We got 15% uh, saying macular. We've got the majority at 68% going with lattice. And then we have 81% saying that we can fit this and help this with a scleral lens. Wonderful. All right. So you guys are right. The majority rules again, where we have lattice dystrophy in this picture, which is more of the lacy um, lattice dystrophy. This, I love all these names because they're really confusing, right? Macular makes you think of the retina. Lattice makes you think of the retina, but we also have different versions here on the cornea. And my rhetorical question for the evening is that a scleral lens will definitely help um, patients like this as well. So let's talk about these different stromal dystrophies. Remember, we're still in the dystrophy category, so tend to be um, you know, not related to systemic issues, bilateral, progressive, and um, inherited. So lattice, a tree branch or lacy pattern, it can even get into a ground glass appearance, which is sad because that's what you know, you're seeing as the doctor and they're seeing out of. So you can imagine what this does to the patient's acuity. Um, they do kind of get colorful, that birefringence where you see multiple um, different colors coming through that cornea. And what is lattice dystrophy? It's a localized amyloidosis that causes haze, and it can certainly lead to recurrent erosions. Um, there's three types of lattice dystrophy. Again, you're going to treat them all very similarly. So uh, I don't think in your chart you definitely have to, you know, um, discern that, but it is, is kind of useful um, because of the way they present. So type one will have the subepithelial opacities and anterior haze. 
Type two uh, for the patient luckily will spare the central cornea, but there actually is a systemic component to this one. And type three happens later in life, but then when it does happen, it's the worst form of all of them. So I wouldn't want any of them, um, but it is an autosomal dominant. So we see it out there in the population. Probably again, I've seen this maybe a handful of times and uh, they could all say that they knew a family member that had this condition in their family. It will cause those recurrent erosions. You need to lubricate, lubricate, lubricate. This is an area where maybe those hypertonic neuro type solutions will work for the patients. I'm more prone to use the ointment form at night. Uh, I work with two cornea specialists, as I mentioned, and one of them is all about the hypertonics and the other one uh, will never even mention them. So, you know, they're not harmful or expensive. So if it's something you want to utilize in your practice, and the patients feel like it's helping, I would not dissuade you from doing so. You can treat the irregular astigmatism with scleral lenses, and we will talk about that later on tonight. And if there's surgical invent, uh, intervention, it tends to be a phototherapeutic keratectomy, and in some cases, there actually has to be a corneal transplant. And that deep anterior lamellar one that we talked about that's more of a partial transplant could be used on this patient because it's not affecting the endothelial tissue. Granular, you know, these kind of are, are pretty descriptive words and you can see in the photo here what granular looks like. It is the most common of the stromal dystrophies. I probably see one every quarter in practice now. Uh, it can cause visual problems, but it doesn't tend to be uncomfortable. It looks grainy and like it would be irritating, but these patients tend to not have a lot of um, actual irritation unless they do get a recurrent erosion. Again, uh, three types. So this is like a good review of your Will's Eye Manual probably. Um, type one is the standard, but type two happens a little later, which is you know only your 20s or 30s, which doesn't seem that late in life. And it doesn't have as many granular deposits. Type three sadly starts at infancy, and it actually can be confused with um, the Reese Buckler that we talked about. So the, again, the treatment is pretty similar, but they are a little bit confusing in their um, presentation. Again, this will cause irregular astigmatism because as you doctors know, anything that's affecting the corneal shape can lead to visual changes that are caused by that irregularity, and that is typically in the form of astigmatism. And if you don't have a topographer or a tomographer in your office, you know, I love my retina scope. I think it is the best old school piece of equipment I have. I simply will do a shine over their cornea. And if you see some scissoring or irregularities in your streak, guess what? There's probably some irregular astigmatism there. If it's pretty, if these um, granular changes have come more superficial, the patient can uh, have a super K or a PTK. But if they become so dense and deeper into the stroma, then they typically do need a cornea transplant. Again, the partial bulk could work for these patients. You know, Katie, it's kind of neat that you said that because, you know, we take, still take students at our practice and, you know, you hear them come in and we have all this kind of cool equipment and we can do OCT uh, uh, of, you know, from limbus Interior. to limbus and yep. see the whole anterior chamber. You can see the lens and it's kind of cool. And they're like, you know, why do we have to do this retina, retinoscope or retinoscopy? And why is there a direct and blah, blah, blah. And I can't tell you how many, you know, with a direct ophthalmoscope, we find that oil drop cataract or use that retinoscope to make that diagnosis. So it's kind of neat that you brought that up is that, uh, you know, for the younger crew, younger audience that's out there, these, if you want to say simple tools, not high tech tools can really, uh, you know, I don't reach for them every day, but man, it's nice to walk down the hallway, find that retina you know, scope head, find the, 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 the handle and go in and maybe solve a mystery there. It saves me time, you know, instead of taking the patient out and running some tests that I kind of already have an idea of, or even just getting an auto refract on them. I just, I'll throw that retina scope up there. I like to tell them that I think Ben Franklin did it by candlelight back in the day. And that was the early retina scope. So I am old school and I carry it in my pocket room to room. All right, macular dystrophy. Again, a nice photo there to show you what this is. So it is cornea changes in the stroma. These are little white grayish spots. Uh, they cause a haze throughout the cornea. They can go all the way to the limbus. They can create nodules. So obviously nodules will create an irregular surface to the cornea, again, inducing some of that irregular astigmatism. 
These ones certainly uh, and more commonly can lead to the recurrent corneal erosions. So I guess this is a good clinical pearl too. You know, recurrent erosions aren't just because the eye is dry or because the, you know, the patient slept with their eye open overnight. We always need to make sure we're looking for, uh, you know, underlying issues. You know, maybe this is a patient that's had these spots that a, another doctor didn't notice because there weren't as many and now the more are showing up. So it's the diagnosis in this is not always just recurrent erosion. There's something underlying that's causing that problem. So this one is our most severe form of our stromal uh, corneal dystrophies, but luckily it is also the least common. As you can see, it is autosomal recessive. These patients are really, really light sensitive to the point where you might be prescribing them, you know, tinted glasses, or I've done tinted contact lenses for these patients to keep them more comfortable. A PTK again um, can be useful, but if this starts to become that severe state later in life, oftentimes these patients need a cornea transplant. And remember, these dystrophies are, are more common to recur in those graphs. Schneider, crystalline corneal dystrophy, just like the name says, look at those little crystals and they become pretty dense uh, as the one in the picture there, you know, that unfortunately they tend to be central right at visual axis. Uh, they're really cool to see under the slit lamp, but for the patient, it's, it's really sad to see those because they can be so detrimental to acuity. So they literally get little crystals that form and um, they can be associated and often are associated with high cholesterol. You know, I think another thing that's really cool as being an optometrist is that we can see something on the cornea that I can, you know, I can guarantee you that a family doctor would not be able to say, oh, there's crystals on your cornea, you probably have high cholesterol. Obviously in blood work, they might be able to determine that, but we can be the ones that say, you know what? I heard this girl talk one night on a Sunday and she said, if there's these crystals in the cornea, it could be that the patient has high cholesterol and maybe they haven't been to their family doctor and had that type of workup. So this is important to keep in the back of your mind that you, know, you might save someone's life um, by helping them with just a, a simple corneal finding leading to cholesterol control. So we certainly wanna manage their cholesterol in this condition, um, but as it gets to the point of scarring and um, the, into the depth of the cornea, the patient could benefit from a PTK or also from a cornea transplant in this condition. So that ends uh, the section on stromal dystrophies. We're gonna jump into posterior corneal dystrophies because I need to make sure I cover all of the parts of the cornea this is one area that we are not gonna say that scleral lenses help. In fact, sometimes scleral lenses can be of a disadvantage to these patients. So in someone with a condition like Fuchs, endothelial dystrophy, if their cell count on, um, let's say specular microscopy is really dwindling, they will probably not ever benefit from a scleral lens if they, if they needed that. Um, because their cornea can't support it, they'll get corneal edema. So I'm gonna step away from my scleral part of, of thinking, and we're just gonna talk about this important part of the, of the eye as well. Uh, this will have that orange peel appearance. You guys probably see this on the regular. This is probably the most common reason in our practice that we will have a patient have a DSEC or a DMEC, which we're gonna talk about here. The cornea will become a beaten bronze appearance and it will lead to stromal edema. So edema is key. Fuchs dystrophy is an edematous condition of the cornea. They'll start to get little micro cysts, and then eventually they can actually lead to boule, which are large cysts in the cornea. And then they can lead to opacification, so we'll get scarring there. And so we do have a specular um, microscope in the office, but honestly, just with your beam, your slit beam, you can see you know, changes over time to that um, with those butata. Hypertonic solutions, as I mentioned before, um, may have a place here. And if they do get bulla that can be very painful as they rupture, bandage lenses will help. Uh, autosomal dominant, again, I think you guys probably can tell me you see this a lot in your practices. And our two options for intervention surgically are decimase stripping automated endothelial keratoplasty or the newer version of that is a decimase membrane endothelial keratoplasty. So we're gonna talk about those here on our next slide. So I thought it was cool when DSEC came out and this was really actually early on in my career when the surgeons started doing this in the practice. 
where it's a partial thickness transplant, but now we're going from the inside of the cornea, from the posterior cornea, and we're selectively removing um, Decimase membrane and, and the endothelial tissue. And this is amazing surgery because it's 100 to 200 microns thick. I mean, we're talking hair thickness that's being um, transplanted here. And there's just a tiny incision where the graft is folded and inserted with forceps, pushed against the posterior part of the cornea. And then an air bubble is put in there to adhere it and to keep it tight against the rest of the cornea. It's such a cool surgery. And when, you know, this is the eye nerd in me, I didn't think anything could get cooler. And then DMEC came out. DMEC takes no stromal tissue with it. There's no stromal tissue. So we're talking 10 to 15 microns thick. I mean, that is tiny. And these surgeons are very talented. They take this tissue and it's in a scroll. It's literally rolled in a scroll. They put it through a small corneal incision and then they orient it, making sure it's not backwards. They have to attach the proper side and they'll push that up against the cornea. And the tissue in our practice is marked with an S. So we can make sure when we're doing the slit lamp exam the next day that the S is oriented the correct way. And so if the S is backwards, that means that the tissue won't stick. And obviously the surgeon did it wrong. So luckily I haven't seen that in our practice, but I am just amazed with this surgery and it works wonderfully for these Fuchs patients. So in your practices, um, hopefully you have really great cornea surgeons to refer to. And I would ask them if they're doing this procedure. It helps the patient with less rejection because the tissue is thinner, it leaves a more regular cornea, um, not a really thick cornea behind and uh, more chance of it sticking to the recipient's cornea. It's the little things, you guys. DMEX make me really excited. Yeah, and a lot of the questions that I get when I present on this is, you know, why do they use a gas bubble um, in a sense and it disappears quickly and how does it stick and it doesn't, you know, stick down? You keep saying it sticks and and because uh, every so often you'll do it, you will get an edge that rolls, but how come they don't have to stitch it down? And the answer to that is that, you know, you have all those endothelial cells that are pumping fluid out of the cornea, making that cornea detergent. And basically, if the donor has healthy endothelial cells, basically all that pumping action will just stick right to that, uh, to the patient's stroma. And you, that's why you just kind of need that gas bubble for a short period of time to allow those endothelial cells kind of suck up and put that cornea in place. So really, really cool uh, technology. That's it exactly. And then that, you know, like he said, it, it goes away pretty quickly. So we have them lay, um, you know, pretty flat with the bubble pushing up and they'll actually stay in the post-operative area for about 30 minutes. And then the surgeon will take a look and then overnight, um, you know, they might get a little less sleep that night because of positioning. But the next day, when we see them in the office for the one day post-op, it's usually about a 25% bubble and then it's gone that afternoon. Um, so it does happen pretty quickly. And it is, it is discouraging, you know, if they come in day one and you see their graph slipping or moving down and you have to rebubble them. So we have seen much less rebubbling in the DMEC procedure. So CHED is less common than, than Fuchs. This is a congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy. It's not inflammatory, but it is edematous. It causes cloudy corneas and it starts at birth. So we have problems just from the day they're born and it comes in two varieties. There's a recessive and a dominant version. The recessive version is um, more bothersome. It's dense opacification. You know, you can think that that would lead to amblyopia because these are babies being born with cloudy corneas. Um, it doesn't progress because it's already pretty bad. And then they tend to have nystagmus. So they don't feel uncomfortable, but they don't see well. And then the dominant version is a slower progression, but it is more uncomfortable. These patients will have more tearing and photophobia. And unfortunately for these patients, they tend to need a full PK because the disease goes from the endothelium and eventually spreads throughout the whole cornea. So this is not one that, that we like to see in our pediatric practices. PPMD, posterior polymorphous dystrophy, this is asymmetric typically, it is bilateral like bar dystrophies are, and it usually happens in our 20s to 30s. There is a kind of a classic hallmark look to this disease as you can see on the, the picture there. 
um, where we have these vesicular lesions that lead to haze more in the posterior version of our area of the stroma. But different from Fuchs, this does not become edematous. So I think it's really important if you just see guttata without edema, then it's not necessarily Fuchs. Fuchs has to have edema. So this is different. This does not have edema, but it should have those classic um, like whitish vesicular lesions. And it's autosomal dominant. There's really not much you can do for this condition. You observe it. Uh, you can do a transplant, but it is very common that it will come back. So again, another tricky case to manage. And, and these are 20 to 30 year olds. I can't say they're my age anymore because I'm not that age anymore. All right, we are ready for a poll. We're uh, over halfway through the talk. So I hope you guys are enjoying. What's wrong with this cornea? So we're gonna move on from our dystrophies and it looks like we're on our degeneration section. So we have Tyrion's marginal dystrophy, furrow degeneration, Salzman's nodular degeneration, Volt's limbal girdle, and of course, will a scleral lens help? So take a look at that picture. And just as a point of reference, there are no questions rolling in. So things are good. People are responding to the polling question really well. I'll throw you that picture again there. We can see some areas of haze here. Again, I tried to be a little nice on a Sunday night. We're just appreciative of people beyond being on here on a Sunday night. We know you've had busy weekends and back to the grind tomorrow. So what's more relaxing than learning about corneas? That's All right, right Tarian's furrow, Salzman's or a vote limbal girdle. All right, well, let's do this and share those results. Can you see the results there, Katie? I sure can. So we had 73% say Salzman's. Very good, you guys. And uh, that is the answer. And then will scleral lens help? See, they're getting more. We're getting more and more. 86% now are telling me that scleral lens will help. So they're catching on to my, my flow here. Very good. We even have people chatting us on Salzman's. So that is certainly Salzman's. And scleral lens, the, the Salzman's nodules, you know, if they're not surgically removed, cause a ton of irregular astigmatism. You take uh, a topographic map and you'll just see these areas of irregularity all over the, the cornea that can be, you know, remedied with a, a scleral type, type of lens. So we went from dystrophies to degenerations, and that's a big difference. So degenerations are acquired, usually secondary to trauma, insult. Uh, maybe from a surgery or can be from aging. There's not typically any inheritance pattern to these. They are asymmetric. Um, I, I'd say typically unilateral, but there's definitely ones that are bilateral. As you can see below, a lot of those are bilateral. So arcus is a form of degeneration. You guys see that all day, every day with lipid deposits, you know, around the peripheral cornea. Um, band K, where you get the calcium deposits, typically at three and nine on the cornea, uh, crocodile chagrin, which is the picture up here, it has that um, you know, color difference there. So it's kind of a, a cracked ice appearance. And furrow degeneration is another one we see that it's like a peripheral thinning at the area of um, where the, between arcus and, and the limbal zone. And so those are some degenerations. We're gonna dive deeper into a few of them. One of those being Salzman's. I am really intrigued by Salzman's. I think because I've watched surgeons take off these nodules and it, they just make it look so easy. You can just like peel them right off the cornea and they come off usually really smooth and pretty easily. So if I see these significantly on patients, I do tend to jump towards a surgical referral um, more often than I might other, other corneal conditions. So patients can have one or many if they have one and it's more you know, mid peripheral or even peripheral, they don't tend to be very bothersome. But as you can see in the photo, some of them can sneak um, really you know, closer to the, the visual axis and they become a whitish blue color. Um, they're a hyalinized collagen plaque, that's what they're made of. And I guess you could say that typically, you know, the, the first time I see these in patients, they don't even know they have them. But they are a, you know, a different shape to the cornea. They have more exposure, so they can get dry, they can erode. Uh, the bigger they are, they can cause more irregular astigmatism and of course, decreased acuity if they're centrally. So I fit a ton of scleral lenses for these. It's probably one of the bigger 
um, degenerations that I see that the surgeons will send for, but we are doing um, super Ks for these PTKs. We rarely ever, I don't think I've seen any that have needed a cornea transplant for this, but it could. Um, but just going in there during the super K and removing those, those little nodules, unfortunately, it'll still leave behind scar tissue. So at that point, they do um, occasionally have some irregular astigmatism that still needs treated, but kind of intrigued by that condition. Tarians can be a little bit rough. Uh, this is peripheral inflammation with little fine opacities of the anterior stroma. This picture um, is showing a pretty severe form of it. 15% of these will thin so much that they actually perforate. And a perforated cornea is no good for anybody. This will happen earlier in life, 20 to 40 years old, typically in both eyes. Um, it is it's tended to be seen more in the male population than females. And then, you know, what happens when you have this irritated, thinned cornea? You know, they get a lot of neovascularization, they'll gutter, uh, they'll get a lot of deposits in that area, definitely irregular astigmatism. Um, a scleral lens works really well here where it can vault over that area and cause um, some good hydration because if they're getting really thin, then they tend to need sutured or glued. So our surgeons actually prefer to do more of a glue on these before they suture. Um, suturing alone can cause more irregularity and, and astigmatism changes. So gluing and if it becomes really bad, a cornea transplant. But look how you know peripheral that is. A cornea transplant is tricky there because they have to really get you know large tissue and get all the way out to that limbal area, and that's a hard transplant to do. So you do not want terians. I've only seen this again a handful of times in our clinics. Now this one you guys have seen a lot of. Um, I really don't think much of it. Actually, a majority of people over age 80 years old are, are known to have a boat limbal girdle. It's that white band at the limbus at three and nine. And students love, uh, Greg, we also have students, they love to write all about it in the charts. And I kind of just blow right over it. But if patients uh, get, you know, they go into their my chart and look at their, their chart, then next year they have questions on their boat limbal girdle. So I do educate on it. Uh, but there's really nothing that you need to do for that. So that's kind of a freebie there. All right, we're ready for another poll question. We're going to keep people engaged. So this one's a little tricky. You know, there's there could be multiple answers for this one, but it is kind of a classic um, condition here that is happening. And I will give you a hint. It's because something happened first that caused A happened to cause B. So is it keratoconus? Is it pellucid? Is it post-LASIK ectasia? Is this a post-RK ectasia? Can we even tell from this picture? I'll talk you through it. And um, I'm hoping for a resounding 100% on number two of will a scleral lens help this patient? So we're looking at a topography here. And just to kind of orient you, you know, we're seeing on this axial map some flattening in the blue area, and then definitely some steepening in the red. Katie, I'm going to assume in your practice, since you see so much corneal disease, you have a topographer that can image the back surface of the cornea along with the anterior surface, or you just have anterior surface type of Correct. technology? So we're um, a tomography-based practice, so we'll show some slides on that later where we are looking um, at the posterior cornea as well, we're looking at areas where you would see things like form frust keratoconus. And so we are able to diagnose these conditions a little sooner because of that technology. Yeah. so my advice is whenever, you know, I do these talks or if we're doing and trying to give our colleagues advice is that, uh, you know, there are topographers out there that image that posterior surface that will help solve a lot of mysteries that's out there. So if you don't have a topographer and you're looking for one, look for that posterior surface. If you're looking to upgrade or you know, you're going to trade something in and going to get a new topographer, make sure you get something that does that posterior surface. It'll be very, very beneficial for you. I'm going to end the poll. Yes. I, I want to comment on that, Greg, because um, you know, I was in a practice before the, the one I'm in now where we would just set, we didn't have that, and we would send to our actually a local LASIK center and they would um, do those tests for us and then we could get that information back. So if you're in a practice that you know, that's just not in the cards for you. You probably have a local center, LASIK or ophthalmology that has that technology that they can run the test and get you those results. So you guys are still wowing me. This is awesome. Um, it is post-LASIK ectasia. So as we could see, I'm going to go back 
here. So we had 55% say post LASIK ectasia. So here on the blue is where the LASIK treatment, you know, flattening of the cornea happened from LASIK treatment. Typically on a topography, you'll see kind of a nice round area of flattening um, surrounded by normal curvature of the peripheral tissue. But in this case, unfortunately, the patient um, became ectatic or thinned. And the answer there is definitely that this is a, an ectasia after a myopic LASIK treatment. And most definitely a scleral lens can help. So I, I typically like to say that the post-LASIK ectasias I'm seeing are not from my cornea specialist, but you are bound to run into those in your career. There was a lot of LASIK done back in the day um, without having any information. I mean, LASIK was done saying, oh, you're a minus two, we'll fix that. And there was no topography, no pachymetry. You know, there was a slit lamp exam and a, and a blessing. And so we have sadly found that those patients were not great candidates for the surgery and ended up becoming a secondary keratoconus from it. So we're going to focus on corneal ectasias for a little bit now. These are typically bilateral and non-inflammatory and progressive. Those are key terms for the definition of ectasia. They um, are typically more central, but they can reach paracentrally and definitely peripherally as well. And this is a pretty dramatic appearance of an ectatic cornea when they look down that their eyelid will become more of that um, triangle shape known as Munson's sign. So keratoconus, near and dear to my heart, probably the first condition in school that um, I wrote a research paper on. And uh, ever since then, I've continued to study. I celebrate National Keratoconus Day, which was November 10th um, this past year. So it's on my calendar. My kids you know, are five and seven, and I make them celebrate it with me. And we talk about what cool things we can do for these patients today. So they know this word. Um, it's central thinning of the cornea into a cone shape. The apex is typically inferior. It happens at young ages. And because of this technology that Greg was talking about, you know, we used to think that one in 2000 people had keratoconus. Now we are wondering if it's closer to like one in four or 500 people. That's a lot of keratoconus. And we're picking it up because of the technology. You know, these are the cases that we can't find it with a retina scope. It's so early or it's so mild. But if they had LASIK, it could become detrimental. So the technology has really saved a lot of corneas and helped us um, get these patients even cross-linked sooner than later. It progresses into 40s and 50s. You know, there's thoughts that our, our collagen becomes more rigid as we get older and keratoconus stops progressing um, in our 40s and 50s. But I think, again, with technology, I have seen some of my patients into their 60s and 70s have changes. Questions of genetic components to this. Uh, there's currently a cheek swab that we use in our office for patients that um, for patients that have children that they want to find out if maybe they are going to have keratoconus. So there's definitely things that the optometrist can do to ask these questions and find the answers and consider cross-linking at a younger age for these um, young people. It will progress over time potentially to having stria and hydrops, which are very painful and cause scarring. And most definitely my number one treatment for keratoconus are specialty contact lenses. And we can have surgical intervention. My number one choice for surgical intervention before keratoconus becomes detrimental is to initiate corneal collagen cross-linking. But if the patient is scarred, it's dense central axis scarring, and they're no longer able to see well out of a contact lens than a um, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty or a penetrating keratoplasty is, is unfortunately the next step for these cases. Hey Katie, the only uh, company I'm aware of is Avelino that does the genetic testing for the cornea. Is Are you using anyone else out there? We are using the Avagen test, Greg. Yep, by Avelino. By Avelino. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So just so our audience knows, there is a the test that's out there, cheek swab, and you know, get the results back. It is really easy. And then they'll even give the patient a genetic counselor as a complimentary follow-up to that test so they can talk about it. So we have seen a lot of keratoconic parents with children, you know, teenagers that we haven't seen anything yet on their um, topographies or tomographies that'll get swabbed and then, you know, find out, oh, yeah, there's something coming here. And, and then we can monitor them more closely and like I said, initiate cross-linking, hopefully at a sooner age. 
So post-refractive ectasia, that was our poll answer. You know, we talked about this already, but um, this is corneal thinning after surgery and it doesn't have to happen uh, immediately. I've seen it happen, you know, 20 years down the road after LASIK, they're doing fine and then their prescription starts to shift. And I seem to feel, and I don't, I don't know if I have any legitimate true study to tell me this, but I do feel like these patients tend to progress later into life um, than my typical keratoconic patients. So if it's a post LASIK ectasia, uh, it seems like in their 60s, I'm still seeing corneal changes in them. And cross-linking is approved for these patients and it, it works very well. So as soon as you start seeing a, a surgery like a LASIK going bad, it's time to talk about cross-linking with your surgeon. But these patients, you know, you, you might think, gosh, their cornea is so flat. Can you fit a scleral lens on these patients? You certainly can. You can fit a reverse geometry, kind of a plateaued shape uh, scleral lens, and these patients do really, really well with it. Um, because the last thing I want them to have to do again is to go through, you know, a full cornea transplant. Pellucid is very similar. And again, if you called this keratoconus, you know, you would still be treating it the same way. It just has its classic kissing dove appearance, typically in the inferior cornea from four to eight o'clock. But again, these patients do very well with scleral lenses, but they also can benefit from cross-linking. And if they have too much scarring or too much irregularity, they may need uh, also a cornea transplant. So just a brief section on ectasias there, but they are the ones that probably benefit uh, the most in our practice from scleral lenses and probably the most common reasons you would fit scleral lenses. So I don't wanna confuse you guys as I put up our next poll. We're getting into a round of infection now, infections that can happen in the cornea. So this picture is someone that is post-infection and with the scarring that we're seeing, does it look like it's post-viral infection? And remember, there's lots of viral infections out there. Uh, bacterial infection, post-fungal, post-acanthamoeba. And we had 98% think a scleral would help on the last one. I'm, I'm really shooting for that 100% because I'm giving you the answer tonight. Um, but yeah, tell me what you guys think. So this picture here is an example of scarring after what type of infection, viral, bacterial, fungal, or acanthamoeba. And we do have a comment, you know, regarding tomography, and I think I'm referring to topography and kind of lumping everything together, but tomography versus topography that's out there uh, using like a plen pl uh, pentacam versus like a placido disc. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's out there. So uh, I guess I'm kind of merging them together and I should separate those out. So thank you uh, with tomography versus topography. And then we have from Jersey here, it says, if there is no corneal scarring, is there ever too late for cross-linking? I.e. example, 50 year old with slow progression. My personal opinion would be no, you could do cross-linking at any time if you are seeing progression. And the definition of progression is, is pretty broad. It could be a decreased best corrected visual acuity. It could be steeper Ks. It could be a changing spec RX with more sill. So luckily those definitions are kind of broad and vague. And so I never think it hurts to send to your cornea specialist and say, hey, get at least a baseline on this patient. And if, that, if they say they're not ready for cross-linking now, maybe in six months they get another measurement and they say, yeah, they are now. So we've done cross-linking in 70-year-olds. Um, so, and we've done cross-linking in eight-year-olds. So there's definitely um, never a wrong time to send those patients. Yeah, I think the key Very word there, because we've, uh, we've done cornea cross-linking on a variety of, I have a family that I'm actually doing genetic testing on. Um, it's kind of neat. The one, the father has a funny thumb, the son has a funny thumb, whatever that would be genetically. I'm going to try and figure that out. We're going to present this family. Um, but the, the father, the son has it, the other guys are form uh, frost keratocones, so on and so forth. But we have, based on the technology picking up and progression, anywhere, like you said, 18 to 20 to whatever decade you want to get into, I send them and the majority of the time, they will cross-link them. Because I think the key word is progression. So, and we're seeing more coverage now with medical plans on this too. So there's there's a big pickup now in that in that arena. So we're kind of torn here tonight on this one: viral infection, twenty six percent; bacterial infection, six percent. So that was our lowest. 
Uh, our highest here was fungal infection at 40% and acanthamoeba 28%. And we had the 81% thought sclerals would help. So the answer on this one is actually the viral infection. So I'll go back and show you, this is like a residual dendrite that's scarred here. So we have to remember, you know, viral infections are things like herpes. And so we're gonna talk about that tonight, but that, that is a scarred dendrite. So we'll start with um, version one here that we're gonna present of herpes simplex virus, HSV. This is more common. 60% of us carry it, actually probably even more than that. You know, the primary infection can go latent and then it can manifest itself later on. We see a lot of people with cold sores and maybe never eye problems, but they also could have eye problems and never cold sores or both. So I asked that question, you know, if they've had cold sores, that helps guide my diagnosis a little bit. Look for follicles on these patients. Make sure you're looking at their skin. They may have some vesicles. They do tend to have SPK, but kind of the hallmark of this condition are those staining dendritic lesions. If you have some Rose Bengal, I think, you know, ours is always expired because we don't have to use it that often, but Rose Bengal will, will stain those end bulbs. And um, if you're feeling fancy, you could even do your cotton whisk test and check out corneal sensitivity. Luckily, uh, and I do like to educate my patients, unless they're extremely immunocompromised, the herpes virus does tend to stay unilateral. Um, but there is an 18% rate of reoccurrence and reoccurrence can come from trauma and um, surgery and stress and sunlight and being sick. So there's a lot of reasons that we need to watch these patients closely. And if it gets into the stroma, it can become much harder to treat and more detrimental for that cornea. Here's our classic dendrite picture here with staining. This is when it's the epithelial keratitis. Lots of different treatments out there, again, cyclovir, a little easier to use, but maybe a little more costly, uh, five times per day until the ulcer heals, and then you take it down to three times a day for another seven days. Trifluridine's been around for a long time. You have to use it about nine times a day. That's a hard compliance, but sometimes that's a more affordable version. You need to lubricate, lubricate, lubricate. I say that a lot during my cornea talks because the cornea is a wet membrane that needs to have lubrication. So pretty much um, when in doubt, add preservative free tears to any of these corneas. And remember, I think you all know this, do not start steroids on an epithelial keratitis because it will make it worse. Uh, there are places for or oral antivirals. We won't go into deep discussion on those, but that certainly can be used if there's compliance issues. And these people will scar um, sometimes, so it's important to keep a watch on them, you know, depending how big or dense or how long these dendrites stay around, they can uh, have some significant scarring and then they might need a specialty lens for that. We have had to do too many cornea transplants for patients that had significant viral scarring um, centrally, but we have seen that number go down with the use of scleral lenses. And then the other version, and I'll show you a photo here in a moment, is when we have the varicella virus version, the zoster version. When it is on the eye, we call it herpes zoster ophthalmicus. And, uh, you know, I love these boards type questions. We have, like I said, a student, so we're constantly going over these things as they're working on boards, that when you see a vesicle on the nose, which is Hutchinson's sign, it's more likely to be in the eye. Doesn't have to be, but it's definitely more likely. These patients have a pseudodendritic appearance. So these are kind of elevated uh, and they do not stain. Your rose bengal will not be useful here. And these patients will have SPK. They can have infiltrates. They're sensitive to light. They're red. They're kind of a mess. You know, their eye is angry. And sometimes it'll follow the outbreak on their skin. And sometimes it'll be the first sign. You'll see this change on their eye. And then you'll say, you know, do you have any irritation um, in your scalp or any tenderness to your skin? And they'll say, you know, actually I do. I was brushing my hair and it was bothering me this morning. And you may be the one that's sending them to primary care and saying, hey, I think this person has you know, this herpes zoster, I think they have shingles starting. Lubrication, lubrication, lubrication. Bland ointments are great. You can put bland ointments or like your erythromycin on the, on the lesions on the skin. This can go into the stroma as well. And that's where a steroid is extremely useful. So these patients, I'm not as hesitant or shy in any way to use a steroid. In fact, it helps a lot of the time. We use double the amount of oral. So if you you know, you want to help with their viral shedding and, and there's some thoughts on, you know, decreasing a, a post-herpetic neuralgia, 
that these patients benefit greatly from oral antivirals and it's double the dose of what you would do um, for our herpes simplex. But again, sadly, we've had to do plenty of cornea transplants for patients that have had um, recurrent issues with zoster or have had very extreme versions of zoster. And I do fit contacts in these patients, but we have to remember that these corneas are very susceptible to stress. And you know, if there is trauma, it can bring the virus back out. So we do have to be cautious with these patients and really watch. I, I keep a close watch on my herpes patients that I'm fitting in, in contacts. I might see them actually every three to four months to watch their cornea. So here's the skin reaction and kind of, a, that looks a little blurry to me, but those pseudo dendrites that do not stain. So before you move on, there is a question that did come in and I do wanna make a comment on <clears throat> when you have the epithelial disease and you're using your viroptic xergan and you're using your oral medication, whatever you're doing to kill the infection, you mentioned about you know not to use a steroid. And I agree hundred percent is when you have the infectious part, but as soon as you see reversal, you're probably gonna introduce that steroid pretty quickly because that dead virus gun gets pulled into the stroma uh, because you've opened up the epithelium and the movement is from front to back there. So I just want to clarify out there for those who are attending is that it's not that you don't use a steroid at all Ever. through the whole process. It's just during that infectious process, which with the medications of Zergan and going orally with Valtrex could just be a few days until you see that reversal. So we just want to make sure that we're clear on that. And the other thing that I'd like to talk about is you did mention that, you know, the zoster virus is definitely more robust than the simplex. So you can get away with a lower dose, but I just keep things really simple in my mind because these medications are so safe. I just do 800 milligrams five times a day for doing a cyclovir or a thousand milligrams three times a day of Valtrex, whether it's simplex or not, because they're so, so safe. And you mentioned it. We want to reduce the viral load. And sometimes we can help them from getting a, uh, a recurrent, uh, maybe cold sore on their lip or elsewhere in their body. They're extremely the safe. These are medications you can prescribe to a pregnant woman. I mean, when people ask, you know, is it safe for me to take this? And you talk about this medication, it, it, it certainly is. And um, I, I love the interactive part of this, Greg, because you bring up some good points. You know, that as soon as their positive staining of these dendrites in simplex are gone, that's when I will consider starting some steroid because I want to reduce scarring. You know, as much as I love fitting sclerals, I don't, I don't want to be the one that, that leads them to need a scleral. I want to help them, um, you know, as best as I can and reduce that scarring. Joe, do, well, well, before Joe, Katie, before we move on, there's a question in here. And then on top of it, you know, I do want to point out that the leading cause of cornea vision loss in the United States, the, the leading cause of cornea vision loss in the United States is herpes simplex. That's out there. Not third world countries, not whatever. The lead, it's cornea blindness or cornea vision loss. It's herpes simplex. It's out there. Someone wrote in here, when do you use prophylactic treatment and for how long? You know, that probably is pretty um, across the board different here. So when do you use prophylactic treatment? I guess I'd want to dive into that a little bit more. Like I, I will, if someone's had a pretty significant zoster, I will keep them on an oral med maybe for years. I mean, again, like Greg said, it's pretty inexpensive and pretty safe. So I will keep them on acyclovir um, for a long time because I'm worried about recurrence. I'm wondering if that's maybe, what do you think, Greg, yeah, that so, question is going? Yeah, I can maybe go down. I mean, in my area, even the ophthalmologists don't want to treat these. I've been labeled as the herpes doc. I'm not sure if I really want that label, <laughs> but I've been labeled as the herpes doc. You need a t-shirt for that. There you go. Maybe, there you go. Maybe we'll do a little fundraiser for some type of cornea <laughs> scarring and put all the proceeds to that. But uh, with that being said, you know, when do you do it? Um, you, you know, someone comes in and they have a herpes, uh, infection in their eye and you clear it and you just got done using a steroid. I make it clear to the patient, look, I use the steroid. If your eye becomes red, because there's a 25% chance that this can come back in the next 12 months. When you have one herpes infection out there, cornea infection, there's a 25% chance it can come back in the next 12 months. You just ended with a steroid. You want to make sure they don't use the steroid to bring in 12 dendrites next time that they, you see them because that was the one that made their eye feel good. 
if they come in in the next 12 months, you can tell them that there's about a 45 to 50% chance once you clear it again, that it's going to come back. So you want to, at that point, address it with them. Most people will decline it. They just say, hey, doc, fix me again if it comes back, because then you can go on the 500 milligrams of Valtrex once a day, once you resolve it, you know, so you got that second infection, third infection of the eye, it's becoming recurrent. Once you resolve everything, then you can say, hey, look, why don't we put you on 500 milligrams once a day of Valtrex, 400 milligrams twice a day based on the herpetic eye disease study. And we can decrease your reoccurrence of this coming back. So that's whenever I would do that. The other question that I get, the other question that really pushes me to do it is I'll say to the patient, do you get cold sores? You get them in the, your lip, roof, your mouth, in your nose. If they go, hey, yeah, I get them all the time. They're annoying. Then that's kind of like, okay, look, I'm an eye doc. You're getting it coming out on your eye. You're getting it coming out on your lip, your nose. How about if I fix your eye and probably will help the other ones popping out on your lip and in your nose and they go, oh, okay. And that's a good way to get on, but they are safe. Now I did get a private message here from one of our colleagues, Linda. It says, these meds are not kidney safe. It says Vala is, or Val, it's probably Valtrex, is Rx TID by pen infectious disease for herpes zoster. So I would say that they're, it says these are not kidney safe. These are cleared through the kidneys. They're not cleared through the liver. You check for people that have maybe dialysis or do have kidney issues, and you can work with the internist and maybe they can adjust up or down. If you're going to go long term, I make a call to the primary care doctor and I just say, hey, look, I'm putting this patient on a chronic Valtrex, 500 milligrams. How about getting some kidney function tests? Sometimes they already have it in the blood work. Sometimes they'll send it. They'll say, go ahead. It's not going to hurt them to be on it for a week or two. We'll get the kidney function test and then they'll check it six months later. So that is a good point that if you're going to put someone on a chronic uh, Valtrex or uh, anti-herpetic is to make sure you get that, uh, that uh, kidney function test. Another one, they're rolling in here for you. So, I know, we could do a whole two hours on herpes. Yeah, we could. So uh, what about Procare amniotic membrane for herpes simplex? I can speak on that, but I'll let you take it. You're the speaker tonight. I, I mean, I'm going to guess you say that you have used it um, in the past. We have used it. I mean, and those membranes are amazing to regrow you know, tissue. So we definitely used it probably. I'm going to guess Greg's probably fitting that more than, than I am in my practice. So Greg, I will let you kind of tail off there. Yeah, the how that comes about is, you know, I use a local pharmacy here. I ask him to keep a couple medicines in stock. Zergan and uh, Atropine are the two that I ask him to keep in stock because it's just hard to find sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I, with, if I have a patient that comes in and they have a dendrite and you and it's centrally located and they don't have Zergan in stock, orally is just as effective. But since it's locally, I'll put a Procara on that eye. Um, and probably almost hundred percent if it's centrally located. So I go centrally located. I'll probably go with an amniotic membrane. That's and an there. oral then that would be your two. Yeah. And an oral. I like that. And I think I want to go one more thing on this before I move on is, um, I'm kind of thinking about the question of, do you use it pro, would you do an oral prophylactically? So let's say that the picture with this guy and he's got some, you know, vesicles at the adnexa um, from shingles and he doesn't yet have it in his eye. Yeah. I'll start an oral for the patient. You know, in Ohio, I can use an oral if it's affecting eyelids and adnexa. And so I would start it here. You know, they could also go to their family doctor to start it, but I, I would do that and get them going on it, especially if they're uncomfortable. All right. Then, so it looks like we're going to have one more, do, one more, Katie, hold on. I know we're going to have to do a herpes talk one night. Yeah, we can. So, uh, Peter makes a mention here about anyone checking vitamin D levels in these herpes patients. Optimal levels either side of 70 might be helpful to reduce the reoccurrence. Yeah, I just came back from an anti-aging functional medicine and in integrative medicine in, uh, in Las Vegas there, Peter. And it probably goes beyond just vitamin D and how all this stuff interacts and with all the um, antioxidants that are out there. So yeah, I think you're gonna start seeing more antioxidant, more integrative complementary type of that's out there, but vitamin D would be a good start. But 
vitamin D touches on a lot of other things just than herpes. But yeah, I, I like the way you're thinking there. Katie, I'm smart, gonna let you take it. Smart crowd here. Uh, I think, you know, as Greg was talking about corneal blindness from herpes, you know, bacterial infections specifically from contact lenses are another huge area in our practice that we're seeing blindness leading to corneal transplants. And so there's such a broad, you know, um, a, array of different bacteria that can cause a bacterial infection. And, you know, again, we could do another two hours on something like this, but, uh, you know, staph and strep and haemophilus and pseudomonas and those contact lens wearers can be pretty horrific to the cornea. And the number one reason is, is you know, abuse of contacts or, um, you know, any issue related to contact lenses, always make them save their case and bring it in. And, and that's something great to culture. These are very uncomfortable, really angry eyes with injection and pain and light sensitivity. They can have discharge. You know, the picture here has a hypopion. This is a bad um, bacterial infection. And, you know, you start with your broad spectrum antibiotics in some of the cases, but sometimes you just got to go um, for the big guns and you got to culture these and you have to see, you know, what's growing there to make sure that it truly is what you think is bacterial. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of fortified drops in these compounded pharmacies. And these patients are left, especially if it's central, with thin corneas, very irregular corneas, significant scarring that oftentimes, you know, will require a cornea transplant. And these can be young patients too. I mean, this can be an 18 year old, you know, that slept in their contacts. And so this is, is pretty darn serious, um, but I have found a place for specialty lenses uh, for these irregular corneas as well. And fungal infections, uh, you know, more rare than the bacterial ones. They do have some very hallmark um, parts to them when you're looking and treating these. They'll have feathery infiltrates and satellite lesions. Though they're, they're probably two of the, of the most classic signs of these. They will have epithelial defects, elevated edges, um, very deep into the stroma, very difficult to treat. Uh, very, very difficult to treat. And the medications that treat them do not penetrate the cornea well. So the, uh, typically these ones end up in ophthalmology's chair because of the medications they need, but you'll have to debride the cornea to get the medications to even penetrate into the tissue. And we're talking, you know, weeks to months. And a lot of times these sadly do end in cornea transplant because of how severe it can be. There's different types of fungus, uh, the filamentous ones that come from trauma or contacts, and then also the candida version, which is a non-filamentous, and those tend to be in more of your diseased eyes. You can see this as uh, something that occurs after a herpes. You know, sadly, they can go from a viral into a fungal because of um, just such a sick eye. Also, um, you know, overuse of steroids. It disturbs your normal flora and you can grow things. If, if someone's abusing steroids or not being monitored on steroids, they can be more prone to getting a, a fungal infection. So these are ones I tend to get out of my chair when I start to suspect that. And um, this is a great place for, you know, Katie, if you don't mind going back for just a little right. bit, you, you mentioned corticosteroid use disturbs the normal flora. Don't forget antibiotic use uh, is probably going to do that as well. And I was defending an optometrist in a malpractice case over alleged mismanagement of keratitis. And this doctor was, was effectively treating a bacterial keratitis with antibiotics successfully. And the cornea was still open, so to speak. And the patient developed a, an adjacent lesion to the initial, uh, initial insult. The patient had been, had been on steroids, steroids were stopped, patient did well actually, but then they developed this, this satellite lesion or, or adjacent lesion when steroids were used, you know, it, it, it got much worse. The antibiotics for the bacterial keratitis supp suppressed the normal floor and allowed a fungus to get in there. So antibiotics wow. themselves can do it as well. Yep, I'm gonna add that to my slide as soon as I'm done tonight, because that is a good point, very true. Acanthamoeba, I've only seen a couple of these in the practice. These, uh, you know, this is the, the hallmark of this is that the extreme pain does not match what their cornea looks like initially. 
But then as it progresses and you're not getting to the right diagnosis, you know, you think it's bacterial or maybe you're starting to think it's something like fungal. And then all of a sudden you start to see these deeper stromal ring infiltrates, kind of juicy looking um, perineural infiltrates that are, are coming up. This is acanthamoeba right here, this picture. This is, you know, when it's getting to its uh, later state and end stage here. Ulcerations, microcysts, it can lead to lots of changes in terms of scleritis and uveitis. It can be very invasive to the eye, um, associated oftentimes with contact lens wear. And again, these treatments are pretty aggressive and they can take a long time. And I do tend to get these again off to ophthalmology. These ones almost always in our practice end in needing a cornea transplant. It's very hard for us to get them to a point where they don't scar um, so significantly that they need a transplant. So there is an option for specialty lenses, but that's very, used very, very rarely. This is a, a, a bad one. So not everything in the cornea um, that we're talking about has to be infectious. There are other forms of keratitis that are non-infectious. Uh, this one, a su superficial punctate keratitis of tigacins. So I'm sure you've all heard of this one. And sometimes it can be confused with other conditions or um, you know, just kind of seems like a dry eye until you start to notice that, that, you know, that foreign body, that sensation that'll come and go over years on end. When they come in, you actually can start seeing those little round opacities across the cornea. They tend to gravitate to visual axis. They can cause decreased vision and all those types of foreign body sensations that um, will go along with it with photophobia and burning and tearing but their eye does not ever seem to get that red. So it always kind of amazes me. The patient feels pretty bad, but their eye actually, until you look at the cornea, doesn't look like they have much going on. And steroid drops work really well for this, especially when it's an acute flare up. Uh, the word of the night has been lubrication. So make sure, you're, make sure you're lubricating these patients. And I have used specialty lenses on these patients to protect their surface. Um, and keep them comfortable. But if they're in an active flare, I am not having them wear their contacts and I'm having them on uh, a steroid eye drop and, and tapering them off of that. But it does seem to, um, in the literature, kind of burn itself out. So they'll have it for a couple years and then they tend to kind of not be, be bothered by it. So I, I think that's an interesting one. Filamentary keratitis. So I, you know, I don't like this for my patients, but I really do, um, you know, think this is a pretty interesting one. I love when I have students and I can show them these little mucus epi cells that are stuck. They're stuck by one base and they're kind of swinging. You know, they blink their eyes and these little things move, and they can come from a trauma or a past surgery. I've seen them in patients by their um, incisions after a cataract surgery, uh, dry eye, neurotrophic patients that are abusing their contacts, um, SLK, if you see superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis patients um, up under the eyelid, they'll develop these little gelatinous blobs. So you obviously need to treat what is happening, the reason why they had it, if it's dry eye or if they're not taking care of their contact lenses, and then you gotta remove these things. So a sterile Q-tip with some um, you know, eye wash, wiping those away, Sometimes these things are really stuck on there and you actually have to get your forceps and pull them off. They do tend to maybe leave a little tiny epi defect, but it's still more comfortable than with the patient having multiple of these on the cornea. You know, as you can see in the photo here uh, with chronic conditions like this, if it keeps happening, you can start to get some vascularization and panis uh, in that area. You need to lubricate. There's been, um, you know, literature on bandage contact lenses helping for the page, helping to remove these and not allow them to reoccur. And I've also had compounded pharmacies make up mucomist, which is this 10% acetylcysteine as an eye drop that they will use for several weeks to help um, get rid of these. And here's where I actually wrote the word amniotic membrane. We definitely have used amniotic membranes for these patients. Sadly, I have a patient that was in a car accident. And she was injured um, on that side of her face and she had trauma to the muscles around the eyelid. And so her eye doesn't close properly. And so her surface has become very dry and irritated. And she has on any given day, 20 to 40 of these that we have to remove. And she's had a traumatic brain injury from this and um, really is unaware of what's going on. Her caretaker keeps bringing her in when the eye is red and she's 
kind of combative and won't let me do much with bandage lenses, but she will let me remove the, um, the, the, the little gelatinous blobs. And so we have done a temporary tarsorophy and actually glued the lid shut um, for several weeks, actually, and she has done much better with that. And you actually can do more of a permanent one um, if the condition is pretty severe. So I think it's a unique condition, and it's something we certainly can be of help with the patient. But make sure you treat the underlying condition. That's really the important part here. All right, you guys, we're coming into the home stretch. We're not even going to get into much on scleral lens fitting tonight because we're really going to focus. Um, on the cornea. So we're getting pretty severe here on this one. This is a pole. And so take a look at that. Uh, the eyelids are important here, looking at the conjunctival tissue, looking at the cornea. This is a pretty devastating condition. So what is wrong with that cornea? Cicatricial pemphigoid, Stevens-Johnson, marginal keratitis, a Morin's ulcer. What does scleral lens help this patient? And as this poll is coming in, there's a great time to address this question. It says for Tagesons and a 15 year old female, how long steroid use? Question mark. Yeah, I, kind of, I guess it kind of depends on how irritated the you know the cornea is looking and how the patient's feeling. But usually, I'd say a several week taper on that and just monitoring closely, making sure they're lubricating. But I don't think it's something they're going to be on for months and months. That usually the flares will be a couple weeks. But they'll wax and wane. So, you know, maybe six months later, that same 15 year old will be back with, um, you know, a flare again. And, and I still am monitoring IOP, especially, you know, young patients uh, that don't haven't had any steroid use before. So make sure you're, you're checking that. And, and this would be a great, uh, you know, this is a great usage. I've been waiting for a, a low dose steroid to come out for years. You know, Isuvis from Kala came out and it's 0.025% um, lodopredinol. You know, it's it's a micro. It's wrapped it wrapped in a slime. It's a little bit of a change in the mechanism of delivery rather than the mechanism of action. And this low dose steroid has been great in these cases. So, I've used that as well, and they've been nice with sampling in the office. So it's something I can get them started with, and then get the pharmacy ordering it for the patients to use. And before that, I was typically using something like a low to max for those patients for those cases. All right, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And there you go. All right. So we actually had 55% say that it was a cicatricial pemphigoid, 29% at Steven Johnson. And people did think a scleral lens would help. So let's click forward here and you'll see it's actually a Steven Johnson, but I, I think it presents very similarly to um, a cicatricial pemphigoid here. So let's Try to get through a few more slides before we let you get back to your weekend, what's left of it. Um, so here's Steven Johnson, very devastating condition for patients, a blistering disease of the mucous membranes. This is throughout the you know, mucous membranes of the body. It's immune mediated when it affects the eyes, those flares are in short bursts of several weeks, but it leaves behind kind of a train wreck um, in its path where it can, you know, destroy epithelial tissue, cause that really deep neo that we saw in the picture there, cause swelling of the cornea, and then certainly affect the eyelids. Uh, we have an oculoplastic surgeon in our practice that has had to do some um, repairs to these eyelids that'll either turn in or turn out. You know, when they turn in, you get the trachiasis rubbing against the cornea, which leads to more neovascularization and irritation and epi defects. And then if it's an ectropion, you know, you have more exposure. And so uh, these eyes need extreme lubrication. I'm putting them on ointments, you know, around the clock. And uh, there could be a place for a prophylactic antibiotic if there is a, um, you know, a corneal defect. Lid hygiene is really important. And I do have uh, just a handful of patients that I have been able to do specialty lenses on them to protect the surface. There's kind of a a trend now in these types of conditions where you can fit a scleral contact, um, what we would call a 12 by 12. So for 12 hours during the day, they would wear their, their daytime scleral lens. And then actually at night, they would wear a different scleral lens, a clean new, um, you know, that lens has been soaking and cleaning all day. And then they put that on at night, obviously needing a high decay I would say this would be fitting scleral lenses kind of off label of how we're typically told, 
But these patients, you know, their eyes aren't closing properly when they sleep, their eyes dry out and it leads to more problems. And so uh, 12 by 12 thinning of scleral lenses has been making some waves out there um, in the industry. And then here's your um, pemphigoid patient, which again, looks very similar. So I think that was a trick question. I'll give you credit for either answer. Uh, very similar. This is a more of a chronic conjunctivitis, again, mucous membranes. Important here is that there's typically autoimmune issues that need to be addressed. So this is, you know, referrals off um, to get blood work and testing done for autoimmune problems. You know, how awful that this can be bilateral for these patients. They develop things like symblephron and shortening of their um, fornices and their corneas can just completely scar over. Uh, you can use a specialty lens to protect the surface, but uh, honestly, what I've done for more of these patients, if it's really um, become a, a white cornea, I've done a prosthetic, um, you know, cosmetic contact lens for these patients just to make sure that they, you know, have more confidence out there and, and get the look um, without people asking so many questions of why their cornea is totally scarred over. So this is really detrimental and it's just so important to recognize that they need um, that extra level of care, um, seeing you know, the people that can help them for their autoimmune conditions. So we'll go to something that is more common um, that you probably have seen many times in your practices, which is something like a marginal keratitis where we see a peripheral infiltrate right where those eyelids cross. So it's superior and inferior margins of the, of the cornea there. And you'll typically see a clear area between the infiltrate and the limbus. There's a classic appearance to this, that foreign body sensation, pain, light sensitivity with a red eye. A lot of times these patients, excuse me, will have a blepharitis um, lid hygiene issue. You can use an antibiotic on these, but these are ones where we love steroids. Steroids work very well on, on this condition. And so um, there are times if they have an epi break that I will certainly need an antibiotic here as well. These can lead to scarring, irregular astigmatism. I've seen some that have been you know, five or six clock hours, so they can be pretty aggressive um, along that hole where the lid margin crosses. And so these can cause scarring and irregular um, tissue that's left behind. But luckily, these are marginal and not affecting visual access. And Morin's ulcer here is um, a, definitely a diagnosis of exclusion. So you've ruled out your autoimmunes. You've ruled out all the infections we've talked about. You've ruled out things like the, you know, the tarians that we mentioned earlier, and you're left with this diagnosis. Gray, white peripheral infiltrate that starts to melt and ulcerate. And as you can see in the photo, it's working its way down um, in the eye and down into visual axis. It can be bilateral, which is horrible. It will vascularize. Um, there are thoughts that actually it is um, associated with hepatitis C. And so when they treat hepatitis C, then they will see that the cornea starts to improve. These patients need steroids. Um, they're at risk for a super infection because the cornea is thinning. They can perforate. Um, we spoke about that earlier when they perforate, they have to glue or suture. These patients will need to be on these immunosuppressants and you really need to protect the cornea. You need to lubricate. And once all is healed and not active, um, they could be fit to treat that irregular astigmatism with something like a scleral lens. So just a few more points. I don't think we have much left in terms of polling, but you know, corneal trauma is very common. You know, people are um, putting up their Christmas decorations and I've already seen multiple Christmas injuries this season. And so we have blunt trauma. Um, make sure you're checking for penetrating injuries. You know, their chamber is shallow. Uh, you have, maybe it was something that, that was at a high speed or force. You need to make sure there's not an intraocular foreign body. Are they leaking with the Seidel sign? And if you are worried about that, then a systemic antibiotic would be indicated. These types of penetrating injuries leave some nasty corneal scars behind. And that's another place where you know, I consider a scleral lens once they're all healed and all is said and done. Chemical injuries uh, require immediate flushing of the eye for a significant amount of time with sterile saline or water. Hopefully by the time they make it to your office, the patient has already done that. Um, if they have not, then it needs to be initiated immediately. You know, We'll do it for 30 to 40 minutes. Make sure you keep pH strips on hand. It's not just for third grade science class. You can actually measure the pH of their, their tears 
and you want to irrigate until you get to that neutral seven, um, that is crucial. So we will just keep dipping into those pH strips and keep going until we see that their, their tears are coming back neutral. These patients are extremely uncomfortable. They need antibiotics and cycloplegics, and they can be left with some significant scarring, hopefully not. But if they are, then there's, you know, tends to be a regular astigmatism. And I, I think an interesting chat would be how many of you have seen someone burn themselves with a curling iron? Because I've seen that more times in my career than I thought I would. My own cousin um, did it the day before her son's wedding. And that was horrible. So she was practicing, you know, the hairdo for the wedding and burned her cornea. These patients can get really bad scarring if it's not treated appropriately. So lubricate, help them prevent infection. Um, you know, this could get so bad that it leads to thinning and uh, some blepharon. And then I'm sure many of you have seen welding um, issues too. So another place in my practice that's really big is we talk about all these corneal conditions, you know, some of them we're seeing result in PKs and DALC surgeries. And so a majority of these patients to see well after a corneal surgery do need a specialty lens fit. Um, I have fit patients that have every single one of their sutures in place, like the photo below. The surgeon says they're doing great. I'm leaving sutures in. Um, I've also fit patients that the surgeon says, I want every single one of those sutures out until you fit the, the lens. So I leave that up to the surgeon. But sometimes, you know, those sutures don't dissolve. They can stay in there. And uh, you can make that cornea very happy with a specialty lens fit. There, those sutures at any time could break, so you have to be prepared to, you know, remove a broken suture if that does happen. These patients are typically on steroid eye drops um, to prevent any type of rejection. You do need to monitor for um, any of that condition with, you know, they have KPs, they are uncomfortable, they need to know to call your office with those issues. I like to call RK surgery the gift that keeps on giving because it's ever-changing. Um, a ton of it was done, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And my cornea specialist was like the number one RK surgeon in Northeast Ohio. And so all of his patients are finding their way back. And um, while the surgery at the time was effective, we found out later it probably wasn't the best way to treat uh, myopia. And so they have these, uh, as you can see with our tomography down there, they have these flattened central corneas and steeper peripheral corneas. These lend themselves so well to scleral lenses. These patients are extremely happy because as their cornea fluctuates throughout the day, you know, the size and shape of those wounds change and uh, the scleral holds everything kind of in a nice place with that fluid layer underneath it. So I think some of my happiest patients are post-RK patients. You know, I have some that would say, okay, these are my morning glasses, these are my afternoon glasses, and these are my evening glasses. And now I can get them into one set of lenses that they can wear all day and they don't have to change prescriptions. So I'm okay. a huge fan. Yeah, Katie, when we were, in, in, I'm in, still in the Altoona area, big railroading area down here. One of the railroad companies paid for our case. So you had the leading Everyone person in Ohio. Them. We have the leading person in probably Pennsylvania. Now you said it's a great way of putting it, the gift that keeps on giving um, just a reminder to everyone, why does this happen is that, remember, LASIK and PRK are subtraction procedures. These are cornea weakening procedures. And that skin, as we get older, becomes weak and, and, and flexes. And that's why you do see patients that have their AM and PM glasses that out there. And then not, not, not just that, it becomes more of a challenge, too, whenever you put an IOL in there, because oh. you want to get that central cornea measurement not the you know, mid peripheral cornea steepening because if they're really, really flat to nail that IOL that's out there. Can be really tricky. And, um, you know, Greg, I hope your surgeon wasn't a cowboy like some I've seen, you know, where they have 16 cuts and these arcuate incisions because the more cuts you're, you're doing, you know, the, the more irregular this cornea is throughout the day and over time. My surgeon, um, my lead surgeon will actually suture some of these wounds if he sees them gaping. And then he'll leave the sutures in for weeks to months, and then he'll slowly start to remove them. And then the uh, irregular astigmatism will start to um, improve. It, it doesn't fully go away, but I haven't seen many surgeons do that. And, and we do get referrals for that. He's one of the only ones in the area that will consider suturing some of the, the wounds that are gaping open. 
You know, so that's a good point is there to point out is that remember that fills in with an epithelial plug every so often I'll have someone that comes in where that epithelial plug comes out and it's kind of like a, a cornea abrasion you've got a BCL on there and just kind of heal that. But remember it's a weakening procedure it splits and then it fills in with kind of an epithelial plug type of thing scarring and so those plugs can come out from time to time. And I've seen nothing worse than an RK incision have an infection in it those are hard to treat so you can. Um, you know, be really cautious in those. You've really got to watch and look at those incisions because they can be prone to infection there. And those are very complicated cases. So just a couple more slides for you guys before we wrap up this exciting cornea night that we're having together. Uh, Post-corneal surgery, you know, intacts were a popular thing back in the day and they're kind of making a second round here. Um, nowadays, you're seeing some surgeons implant those um, with cross-linking in our keratoconic patients. You do need to watch if they're not in the right place, they can actually erode through the cornea and have to be taken out. Um, actually, some of my most irregular corneas I fit are those that had explanted intacts, and now they've got irregular corneas and scarring from the intacts, and so I'm fitting those patients in sclerals. Corneal collagen cross-linking, I think you can tell I'm a huge fan of this procedure. Uh, with that, we are finding that we're typically fitting these patients in sclerals about two to four weeks after their surgery, as long as the cornea is clearing and healed, and we don't see haze. And a lot of times I'm able to start with their pre-crosslinking lens and um, not having to always refit them. But they're, you know, it is hard for these patients to stay out of those sclerals for too long, so we will fit them pretty quickly. So we already know the answer to this question here. Um, that is the end of my cornea talk with all of you tonight. We covered a ton of things from dystrophies, degenerations, infections, surgeries. I hope this felt like a somewhat inclusive way of walking through kind of the, the manual. And um, I do see I, my chat showing up now that I'm stopping my talk here. And we are doing cornea um, epi off because that is the current um, on-label use of, of cross-linking. So we are doing the I-link um, preferred way right now of doing corneal collagen cross-linking. Any other questions as we wrap things up this evening? I enjoyed getting to speak with all of you and uh, making this interactive with, with Greg and Joe that made this hopefully more fun for all of you instead of just reading off slides. Yeah, I'm gonna see if there's any more questions that come in. There was one. Did you see the did you get the one cornea on, cornea off? Do you prefer? Yes, I did. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, I'm just gonna go good. through a few kind of real quick slides here so we can finish up on time. Can I, I give think them this is email an, real quick, Greg. Would you mind? What's that again? I'm sorry. Can I give them my email real quick? Yeah, just type it in the chat box. And, and oh, you can, can say it out that. loud too. Do it both. Type it in the chat box and give it I'll out. I'll type loud. it in the chat box. There it is too. Okay. I will hand this off to you guys. You guys can email me anytime if you have cornea questions or scleral questions, I'd, be, I'd love to chat with you. So I just wanna point out a couple of things since we talked about amniotic membranes and infection. And you know, I'm not here to promote one am amniotic membrane versus another. This is nothing more than the package insert of a dehydrated. And I just wanna point out that it says right here under general use, it is considered wound covering. This is right on their package insert. It says right here, dehydrated wound covering. But look when you come to the contraindications, it says it should not be used in, an, uh, in active infections. So I know that there's a little bit more profitability out there in your amniotic membranes, but you hear my partner out there, Joe does a lot of defending of optometrists. It's kind of hard to defend this when it says, why did you use a dehydrated on an infectious keratitis? When it says right here, you should not use a dehydrated in a active infection. So with that in contrast, when you go to Procara and you see that it says a cornea band-aid, right, wound healing rather than wound covering. And you can see here when you come down, you, it's really contraindicated in glaucoma uh, drainage devices and blebs because your glaucoma doc would be a little bit mad if you scarred down that bleb after you had a successful bleb. So it's not contraindicated in an infectious keratitis. So I'd like to point that out there since we talked about using it in herpes, we focused on Procara. This is the reason why and all you have to do is read the package inserts and it says right there, uh, active infection. I wanna run a quick video here and I can share these with you, uh, Katie, cause uh, 
this is a patient that's getting PRK. And I just like, though, these are always kind of like crowd pleasers, like, wow, this is what's happening here. This is someone's getting PRK. They're going to remove the epithelium with, a, with a, I think this is a beaver blade. You might know better being in the cornea. But you can see they're scraping away here. You can see the cornea indenting the pressure they're putting on to get down to that anterior stroma to reshape and subtract that. Look how much scraping it's going on. Now, what I want to show you on this one here is the PTK that's going to be done on a recurrent corneal erosion. The patient already has a wound, but watch how easy this comes off. And I always love showing this because imagine that eyelid sticking down to this anterior surface and the patient waking up. And you could see this is just anterior basement membrane disease. Look how easy this comes off. This is why these patients end up with recurrent corneal erosions right here. And this is what we talked about, you know, using the micropuncture. We talked about using the amniotic membranes and, and doxycycline to help these patients out. But look how gentle this is and look how easy that epithelium comes off as opposed to the PRK patient and when you have healthy anterior basement membrane. So I like that you just a, had all this at the ready. That is impressive. Well, I just sitting at my computer and just pulled it out and I knew where the lectures were. So I just pulled a few slides. So I had some downtime while you were talking. So Katie, I want to thank you.